communion didn't exactly start on the last night of uh, before Christ was uh, arrested. And it turns out that breaking bread was a Jewish tradition. It was a tradition that Jesus would have known about. It was, and when they would break bread at the meal like Seder and they would break and thank God for uh, their many blessings. So, so breaking bread started before Jesus came to us. When Jesus came came to, to be the culmination of that gift that we know in the Jewish faith. When Jesus came to be the fulfillment of the scriptures, the breaking of bread took on a new meaning. It became richer. It became literally flesh and blood through Jesus Christ. So the beginning of our communion goes back to these early, early days. In fact, the first time that we actually realize how powerful this breaking of bread can be is in the, the day of resurrection. Jesus uh, has, has died on the cross and he's risen from the dead three days later and we hear in Acts 2.42 about the, general, the two disciples walking to Emmaus. And on the road to Emmaus, Jesus encounters them, but they don't know it's Jesus. They, he comes to fulfill the, the scripture with them, but he isn't apparent to them that it is Jesus until they sit down at a meal and break bread together. And as soon as they do, they realize it's Jesus. It is a, a note to us to notice that this is part of that, of the power of this grace of God, this gift of God that is given to us in communion. In many ways, the United Methodist Church was born out of a desire to receive communion. When the early church started here in America, they, there were many people that wanted to worship God and many people who wanted to receive communion. But the, way we could, the only way we could receive communion was having a priest there to, uh, to see over the table, oversee the table. And, and so Wesley went to the Anglican Church and said, look, we've got people, we've got people. People that need, want communion out in the, out in the beginnings of this country and, and we need to get communion to them. But the Anglican Church would have nothing to do with it. So Wesley ordained by himself two, two bishops, Coke and Asbury, as in Cokesbury, and they were sent to America who then created the circuit rider system where we had ministers on horseback and local pastors that rode from place to place all so people could hear the word of God and receive God as part of communion. Union. So we have this wonderful heritage that's tied around communion in our church. That's what God meant for us. And today we talk about the great, the great uh, Thanksgiving. Eucharist, we use the word Eucharist sometimes to describe communion. That actually means Thanksgiving. Communion is Thanksgiving. That's what God has given us, this gift. This gift of bread and juice that is the body and blood of Christ. So what is it that we should know about it? Well, the first thing that Paul tells us in this passage is, is that it's directly from Jesus. I received my instructions from the Master himself and passed them on to you. This is Jesus. This is what this is who what's going on here. This is Jesus for us. You you hear those words. But the first thing that happens is we want to know how. Well, well how can that be Jesus over there? And there's been battles and divisions in the church eternal over how Jesus is present in the bread and the juice, or the bread and the wine. In the Catholic Church, it's called transubstantiation. Say that to pass three times. Transubstantiation. What that is, it means that what the Catholic Church believes is that, that this gift that is in front of us actually becomes the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. Literally becomes the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. In the Wesleyan tradition, we don't, we don't see it that way. We know that Jesus is present in the elements, in these gifts. We just don't know how. Is that okay? 
Yeah, yeah, it's okay. We just need to know that Jesus is here. That Jesus is bringing himself into this gift in a spiritual way that we can receive Jesus. So the first thing, the, what we have to know is that, is that this is Jesus. And that, that Jesus has ordained that we would do this in remembrance of him. The Methodist Church says it this way. The Christian church has struggled through the centuries to understand just how present, how Christ is present in the Eucharist. Arguments and divisions have occurred over the matter. The Wesleyan tradition affirms the reality of Christ's presence, although it does not claim to be able to explain it fully. Jesus is present. We just don't know how. Now, what are we to do with that? What are we to do knowing that Jesus is present? Well, does it matter that he's, how we see it? No. Colossians 3, 1 says, If you're serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ, act like it. Pursue the things over which Christ presides. It doesn't matter what's there. What we need, matters is how we respond to it. It doesn't matter what theology you follow or what church you go to. It's how you respond to Jesus Christ's presence in your life. Do you agree with that? Okay, no no's. We're doing good. Then Paul writes these words, when he writes the words, Do this in remembrance of me in his letter that we read today, according to the New Interpreter's Bible, he's remembering the whole story of redemption. And we have a tendency to remember the Last Supper, but it is beyond that. In fact, the scripture goes on to say this morning, and you heard it, it goes on to say, From the cross to Christ's return. That is the entire redemptive story. From the cross when we were redeemed by his blood to Christ's return when we fully realize the kingdom in this place. So when we receive communion, yes, it is about the death on the cross and his gift for our salvation. But it's also remembering that he's coming back. Remembering that he's working in this world right now, right in this instance, to redeem the world that the world might know Jesus Christ. He's working in us right now to be part of that redemptive story. So it's not something 2,000 years ago. It's not something just when we come to the table. It's something we live out in our lives as faithful Christians, as faithful people who follow Jesus Christ. That's where he calls us to be. Communion is the remembrance of our redemption from the cross to the kingdom come. That's pretty powerful. That makes this a bigger deal, doesn't it? I think it does. This is my body. When we hear that term, this is my body broken for you. We remember that Christ is with us. We remember that he gave it for us. So when every time you hear, this is my body broken for you, you remember he's there for you. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, Christ is here now for you. He's not here on anything but love. So it doesn't matter what you've done or what's on your report card. My grandmother used to tell me God kept that report card. Did you ever get that? I had a lot of black marks in that report card. That's not true. He's here. He's behind me 100%. He's behind you 100%. And when we receive the body, that's what we know. Christ is for us. There are days when that's very hard to hear. There are other days that it is so good to hear. Christ is for us. He wants the best for us. He wants that we, our created purpose, be lived out. He wants us. Romans 8.31 says, What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? So Christ is for us. And we are for Christ is the other half of that story. We are for Christ. It says in 1 Corinthians 6.15, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? So he is for us, but we are for him. Him. 